If you would, go ahead and take your Bibles, turn to Galatians chapter 5. Uh, we are going to be parking right here in Galatians chapter 5 for probably about the next nine weeks, okay? Uh, because there's just a lot of stuff that we want to look at. If you were here last week, um, you will know that we made it through the introduction, and that was all. Because, my goodness, we would have been here till probably 3 o'clock. Okay, that's an exaggeration. But we would have been here a long time if we had kept going. And so, uh, in your bulletin, uh, it's the same insert as we had last week. So, if you had last week's insert, go ahead and use that. If you weren't here last week, go ahead and start, uh, start here. But if you're missing anything, I can't tell you how many phone calls I get during the week. Hey, what was this blank here? Or, or I wasn't here. Can you send this to me? And my answer is always, sure, we can get that to you, okay? And so uh, we want to make sure that you have all of that. Uh, we're talking about the fruit of the Spirit that we find in Galatians chapter 5. Uh, when we start... Uh, when we started last week, we started in verse 16, and it talked about the conduct of the world, and the Apostle Paul starts with that, and he says, you know what, this is what the world is like. And then he says this, don't be like the world. Don't do these things, and if you look at that list, uh, then you see there, I'm, I'm going to say, uh, we need to agree with the, the Apostle Paul. Don't be like the world. Okay. When we come to Christ, we are made new creations in Christ. We are given new characteristics that we are to live out, that we are to make a verb, things that we are to do. And we find these in verses uh, 22 and 23. It says this, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such things there is no law. And then it goes on to say, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. In other words, we're not going to be uh, like we were formerly. Uh, that list that we see in the preceding verses, we're not going to live like that. He goes on to say this, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Uh, we are told that we are to exhibit uh, the godly characteristics that make up the fruit of the Spirit. We talked about last week how the fruit of the Spirit is not something that is based on words. It is not demonstrated or it is demonstrated by being and not doing. In other words, the fruit of the Spirit is just kind of who we are, right? It's not, it's not a works-based thing. This is a pattern of everyday living, something that we are supposed to live as. We talk about how the fruit of the Spirit is singular, and you might say, well, we got nine things here, because we're going to be here for a while. How is nine things one fruit? Well, it was kind of likened to this. The reason why we put it that way is because uh, the fruit of the Spirit is not a smorgasbord. Okay, so I'm going to pick on my bride for just a minute here, okay? Uh, we love fresh fruit. And so very often, uh, uh, we will do that. We will have, like, uh, crackers and cheese and fresh fruit and things like that. And so we will get grapes. We will get strawberries and, and different things like that. Um, Karen does not like raisins. To her, uh, when she picks up a chocolate chip cookie and she finds out it's raisins instead of chocolate chips, that is like the worst thing ever. <laughs> it broccoli. really is. It's like broccoli without cheese. Broccoli is bad anyway, even with cheese. It's just, yeah, it, it's a thing. So if we have a fruit salad and there's raisins in them, now Karen is gracious enough, she won't pick them out, but I know some people that will, right? The fruit of the Spirit isn't like that. You cannot say, uh, I'm going to have love, but eh, joy I'm not feeling it, so we're just, we're just not going to put that on the plate and self-control. <laughs> Who wants that? So I'm, I'm not going to go there because, well, 
I liked having a temper and just flying off the cuff there, and, and uh, I'm not going to do that. Scripture doesn't tell us to do that. We are told that we are to exercise the fruit of the Spirit, these nine characteristics that work together to make us who God wants us to be. Okay? So you can't pick and choose. It's not a buffet. And it's very important that we know that. We talked about how um, this is done in cooperation with the Holy Spirit of God. Okay? You and I, uh, in and of ourselves, we cannot practice these things in our own strength. Why? Um, because we're no good. Right? It's very difficult for us to do that. To love the unloving. To be joyful when things seemingly are falling apart around you. And, and we discussed that, that this is all done in cooperation with the Holy Spirit of God. That is part of what being a new creation is like. And it is done as we cooperate with the Holy Spirit. We also talked about this, that one of the uh, byproducts of the fruit of the Spirit and exercising that is that it is a delight to the unbelieving world. We said this, uh, the world is watching you, right? The world is watching you. They are seeing how you are going to react. And can I say not just the individual things that happen, but can I even say on the, on the national scale and the things that may happen that you don't necessarily agree with, people are watching you knowing that you're a child of God and seeing how you are going to respond to these things. And so it's very important for us to know that if the unbelieving world is watching us and has their eyes on us, part of exercising the fruit of the Spirit is going to be this. Uh, it is going to be something that is so radically different than what they have seen and what they have experienced. It's going to be one of those, oh, this is refreshing. This is nice. Okay? It's going to be something that is very delightful. We talked in John chapter 15, we talked uh, briefly about what it is to abide in Christ and to bear fruit. And bearing the fruit is the proof that we are his disciples. Being fruit producers, that is what that looks like. And so as we, as we uh, get started here this morning, uh, we see this, that uh, the first fruit of the Spirit is love. It's the first in this long list that we see. And we want to look at this for a little bit this morning. Uh, you know what? The English language is very sloppy, isn't it? Okay. I have heard that from teachers. Uh, who, English teachers who will say that the English language is just the sloppiest language that there is out there. To which I always said, well then, uh, why did you give me that grade on the paper? It should be a curve just based on how sloppy English is anyway. That didn't go over well. But yet, while the English language is a very inexact language, the Greek language is not that way. Okay? Uh, the Greek language when, when you stop to think about it, it has multiple definitions and multiple words that describe the same English word. So, for example, you might say, I love my family. And that's great. I, I pray that you all do. Do you love your, your family in the same way that you love spicy Mexican food? If you do, we really need to talk, okay? Uh, but you see where there's different definitions. You know, you might say, I love my pet, okay? I love my dog, I love my cat. Uh, in, in keeping up with the pollens, I love my ducks, okay? Uh, I certainly don't want to leave them out. Uh, that is going to be very different than saying, I love God, right? There are different definitions for the word. And so in the Greek language, there are really uh, four different words that describe the concept of love. Okay? The first one is this. The first one is phileo. We are about halfway through the slide presentation there, okay, aren't we? 
Uh, the first one is phileo. This is to have a tender affection for. It's referred to as brother, brotherly love. We have a city here in the United States. What is it? Philadelphia. It's a city of brotherly love and, and uh, well, the Philadelphia states, right? All right. It's a concept and a word that is used to denote friendship. And that is how the New Testament primarily describes this word. It is a word that denotes friendship between people. The second word is eros. Okay, and this is a sexual or a passionate love. It's uh, where we get the English word erotic from. When scripture was written, that word had such a bad connotation in the Greek language, you will not see that word, love, used in scripture. It's in the Greek language, but you won't find it in scripture. It's not there. The third one is called storge. Love and affection between family members. Okay? I love my family. And really, in the New Testament, it's used in a compound word, and I believe it's in the book of 1 Timothy, and really, even that word has a negative connotation to it, where it talks about families that are unloving. Unloving. Is there such a thing as an unloving family? Yeah. Sure there is. Why? We live in a broken world, right? And so in the New Testament, we see that word is used really one time, it's used in a negative way. Uh, the majority of times that we see the word love uh, in the New Testament, it is the word agape. It is used to describe this word love that we see in Galatians 5, 22. It's the same word that is used to describe the love of God towards us and the picture that love is a definite choice. Love is a choice. We look at the love that God has for us. You know what? It's not based on, on feelings or anything like that. The love that God has for us is the love that sent Jesus to die on the cross for us. It is a sacrificial type of love. And that is the word that we see so very often in Scripture. When Jesus spent time with the disciples, uh, just hours before his crucifixion, several times he commanded them to love each other. To love each other. This was a very turbulent time. There were a lot of questions. There was a lot of anxiety. Pretty soon, we see that on the stage here, uh, things are going to pick up very quickly to where Jesus will be arrested and ultimately crucified. We're going to see that the disciples scatter for a time. We're going to see that Peter denies Christ, and yet, with all of this stuff going on, Jesus gives them the instruction in spite of the fear, in spite of what you're going to see, in spite of, in spite of the anxieties, you need to love one another. The first time that Jesus gave this command was immediately after he gave the model for what this looks like for when he washed the feet of the disciples. An act of sacrifice. In John 13, he says this, A new commandment I give to you, love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Jesus commands that they are to demonstrate that love. It is to be a verb. It's not just something that we say, but something that we do. Last week, we talked in John chapter 15 
This is the second instance that is recorded here. John chapter 15, verse 12, this is my commandment, he writes, that you love one another, and he gets the model here, as I have loved you, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Once again, they are being told to love one another, and they are to use Christ is the example of what that looks like. Love is more than words. Love is demonstrated by what is done on their behalf. And I think that's true. That's true today. You know what, I think we use that word love so flippantly at times. Uh, I think that there are times where we look at that word and, and boy, we can say that uh, uh, we love God the same way that we say we love the Detroit Lions. Um, two totally different things, but yet we do not differentiate between those things. Uh, we need to be able to do exactly that. Uh, loving God and loving the Detroit Lions are two entirely different things. And yet sometimes it's hard to know where we personally draw that line. Galatians uh, chapter 5 verse 13, it gives us some more insight into this. For you were called to what? Freedom. You were called to freedom. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through what? Love serve one another. One of the purposes of the church. One of the reasons why we are here is to serve one another. How do we do that? Do we do it out of obligation? I certainly hope not. Do we do it out of love? Do we do it out of love? You know, as I was putting this together here a few weeks ago, I couldn't help but think, um, last year, uh, we've all tried to forget 2020, right? Uh, I'm gonna take us back there just for a moment. As a pastor, one of the things I absolutely loved was when there was a need, I was not the only person who would meet the need. Do you know that I had people on my speed dial? So somebody might call and say, hey, I'm not feeling well, but I need medication. Um, is there any way we can make that happen? What was my answer? Yes. You better believe it. Okay. How did we make that happen? It would go something like this. I would get a phone call saying, hey, I need help. And I had, I had a list of people that said, you know what, at any time I am willing to help. And so I would work the phones. Do you know I never had to call the next person in line? I would, Margie, I'll pick on you. I could call Margie and Margie would say, yep, I am right on. And she would go out and do those things. Trish was another one. Trish would just go out and do those things. There was a bunch of people that we had lined up. You know what? They didn't do it because they had to. They did it because they loved you. And that was a, just a great example for me as I was sitting at my desk and as I was dwelling on that. That is what love looks like being willing to go and to do and to serve one another. And you know what? They served with gladness. I would dare say that for every known example that there is of people that help, there are hundreds of examples of things that we don't even know about. How you help somebody else or maybe you were on the receiving end and let's face it, we are great at giving, but we are rotten at receiving. Uh, there is a blessing in both, right? Uh, there really is. And I'm thankful for those that were able to help. I'm thankful for those that were able to receive because I know that many of the people that received, once they were well, they went on the list and they were given. See, for every known example, there are hundreds of examples that 
aren't even mentioned. And here's the thing, uh, it's not important that we know that, uh, but can I say this, that God knows. That's what love is. Through love, you serve one another. And sometimes that's hard. We all know the adage, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Yeah, and yeah, that's not true, right? Words can hurt, right? Uh, they just can. Uh, they can build up or they can tear down. We choose to build up. Genuine agape love is in the business of building. It's in the business of building, and that requires action. I want to take just a few minutes as we look at uh, as we look at a practical application of what this love looks like. Uh, the first one is this: developing love in the way that we treat each other. We keep the focus not on ourselves, but we keep the focus on others. Uh, that certainly is the nature of God's love for us. Uh, Jesus did not leave the glories of heaven and die on a cross for his benefit. And I say this, he did it for us. Amen. He did it for us. And so the first step in developing love within the body is for us to get the attention off of ourselves. And can I say that focusing on the person that is sitting next to you. Okay. Focusing on your neighbor. Focusing on the people that you live with. The people that you work with. And this isn't something that comes very easy for a lot of people. It's not something that is natural. It's something that we need to work on constantly. In Philippians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul kind of gives us the motivation for this, where he writes, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but rather do it in humility and count others, what? More significant than yourselves. That each of you look not only to his own interests, but to the interests of others. How can I help those that are around me? What's the motivation? It's not that, hey, look at me. It's rather this, counting the other person more significant than yourself. Trust me when I say this, that this is something that is so unnatural to us as people. Can I say that the unbelieving world will take note of this if you do that? I love what Pastor Scott said. Uh, he said, you know what, sometimes it's the simple things, right? I don't know about you, I need simple. All of you are going, amen. I do. I, I admit that. It's as simple as holding a door open for somebody. It starts there. Is that a difficult thing to do? No. Really? That's not difficult. Not in the very least. How about putting a smile on your face and saying, saying hello and just having a friendly conversation? Is that difficult? No. Marilyn's going, well, I don't know. <laughs> you know what? It's not difficult. God calls us to show love, and, and really, we can do it in so many small ways. How can we love people in big ways if we can't do it in the small ways? It's an important thing to know that when we act that way, an unbelieving world certainly will take note of this life. Uh, that is something that is very different uh, to them. Uh, there's some bullet points there, I believe, on your on your uh, uh, bulletin insert. There's some things to think about. Uh, do I always think about how something will affect me, or am I concerned about the impact it will have on someone else? Do I insist that things be done my way, or maybe do I get input and go along with the methods of others? Uh, newsflash, your idea may not be the best idea, and that's okay. Do I rejoice when others succeed and get recognition? Or do I pout? <laughs> what a word. Do I pout because they get more recognition than I do? How about this one? Do I listen to others? 
Or am I already thinking about my response before they even finish talking? I have always said there is a difference between hearing and listening, right? That's what this is getting at. Uh, secondly, uh, give generously. Give generously. I think we can all quote uh, John 3, 16. Uh, talk about the ultimate uh, verse when it comes to giving. And God so loved the world that he what? He gave his only son. That whoever believes in him it should not perish but have eternal life because because of the fact that God loves us, he gave. And if we are going to love others, our lives will be characterized by giving. It's really a stewardship issue in all parts of, of the life that we have. I'm reminded of what giving generously looks like out of Matthew chapter 24. Verses 35 through 40. I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Just about every part of life is addressed here, and in each of those parts, uh, needs were addressed to there. The righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty? Give you drink. When did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison? When did we visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you, what, you did it to me. You did it to me. That is what the giving generously looks like. You know what, this just really scratches the surface on this topic. But we need to give more than lip service to giving generously. Here in Matthew 25, we do it. We do it. So as we look at developing uh, love in the way we treat others, we also develop love in our corporate worship. Okay, so instead of focusing on ourselves in worship, we are focusing on the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We are keeping our focus on God and God alone. Several times this week, I read statements from different theologians and commentators that said this. Worship is not about you. I like that. Because you know what? Worship isn't about me. And all of you are going, that's right, Pastor, it's not about you. It's not about you either. Okay? You know, God is the object of our worship and our praise. And so as we worship God, can I say, whether it's here, uh, whether it's home, wherever we find ourselves, uh, we don't keep the focus on the people next to us. We keep the focus upward. Uh, we keep the focus on God himself. I love the book of Psalms, and we've been in there the last uh, several Friday nights as we've done our book on the Sabbath. Uh, there are some great songs that are used there in the worship life of, of Israel. And if you look at so many of those, the worship songs that you find in the book of Psalms are not directed uh, towards the people that are around, but they are directed to lift their eyes heavenward to God and to praise God and to worship God. They are praising Him for different things. They are praising Him for provision. Uh, David, over and over again, praises him for protection. I love that Psalm 51, where David is praising God for redemption. David is praising God for forgiveness. And David is really pouring out his heart there. You know what? We worship God 
and we need to keep the focus on God, not being so self-centered that we think that the announcements that we have, that the ministries that we have here in this church, that the songs that we sing all revolve around what we like. Worship isn't about us. Worship doesn't focus on us. It focuses on God. And that should change how we look at how we worship. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's all about God. Lastly, and you're going to say, hey, we already did this point. I'm doing it again. Why? Because I think it's in here. Uh, corporately, as we come together, uh, give generously. Give generously. Not just in an individual mode, but also uh, corporately as we worship together. Uh, the Bible describes our worship in terms of being a sacrifice. We see this in Romans 12. Romans 12 says that we are to do what? Offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. Now that's something that's totally different, isn't it? Because what normally happens to sacrifices? I'm not sure how to spell it. That's why I didn't put it in your bulletin, sir. Okay? But here's the thing. Okay? Uh, the Apostle Paul says, uh, you're a living sacrifice. You are dead to yourself. You are dead to sin. You are alive to God. Uh, but we are to live our lives in such a way that we are living sacrifices and that is our spiritual act of worship, it says in Romans chapter 12. In, Roman, or in Hebrews chapter 13, we are told that we are to continually offer a sacrifice of praise to God. You know what? When times are great, we praise Him. When times are great, we praise Him still. We praise Him still. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, we are encouraged not just to praise, but to also give generously and cheerful to the work of advancing the kingdom. Give generously. Serve the Lord with gladness. When we begin to worship a God by giving generously, we will also begin to transform our ability and willingness to give generously to others as well. When we are giving to God, it is much easier to give to others. The fruit of the Spirit is love. The fruit of the Spirit is love. This is just one of nine. We have eight more to go. But we're not going to go there next week. I got myself in some trouble when we scheduled this. Margie called me on the carpet. Because Scott is preaching next week. And <laughs> not quite sure how to take that. That's okay. Uh, Scott will be preaching next week. Uh, Margie and Gary and Susie will not be here. Uh, technology is a wonderful thing, okay? Uh, so we will pick up uh, Joy here in two weeks, okay? Um, I am looking forward to that. Uh, God calls us to live a life of joy, okay? Uh, I heard so many people say 2020 was not the year of joy. Uh, I'm not sure I agree with that. Okay? I think, yes? It'll be three weeks for joy. It's not the joy. That, okay, yeah, three weeks for joy. It's going to be a while. But we will come back to it. Okay. Here's the thing. Um, like I said, good times are bad. Uh, we exhibit joy and supernatural delight in the purpose of God, the plans of God, the presence of God. Uh, we will be talking about that with Scott in several weeks. Okay, And uh, so I uh, encourage you, um, uh, please uh, pray for Scott this week as he prepares to uh, minister next week. I am so looking forward to that. And uh, that conference week is coming up very, very soon as well. So, uh, 
Let's pray, shall we? Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that we have examples, not just of what love is, but Lord, how we are to exhibit that as we as we live our life from day to day. Uh, Father, this isn't something we just do a couple hours a week when we are at church. Uh, Lord, there is an unbelieving world that, that needs to know what true love is, and we can show that, Father, as we engage with that, uh, may we be uh, very quick, Lord, to do exactly that. And to show them what sacrificial love is, you are the, you have given us, uh, Jesus Christ, the greatest example of what it is to give. Father, let us share what it is, Lord, to love others by sharing with them the greatest gift that we could ever receive. We thank you in Jesus' name.